Hi everybody. We're at uh, my house today. Vaughn's come for another visit and we are going to discuss several topics of which people have been writing in about and uh, on an individual basis getting some counsel and some ideas of how to handle mm -hmm. things. The first thing we want to talk about today was blood pressure yes. because it's it seems in the whole cardiovascular story, blood pressure plays a big role. Absolutely. So could you just go ahead and tell us what, what, what we have to look out for, what we need to do, just uh, little things to look out for. And sure. Well, first off, when it comes to blood pressure, there's a, there's a few things that aren't commonly understood, which I think create alarm. One is that blood pressure varies naturally over the course of the day, over the course of a month, and over the course of a year. Mm -hmm. So your blood pressure is actually supposed to be lower in the morning and higher in the afternoon, and it's supposed to drop off again towards the night. It's a natural part of what's called the circadian rhythm, which is your body's internal clock. Mm. It sort of regulates the timing of everything that happens inside of us. And your heart rate naturally speeds up in the afternoon, and you naturally release chemicals like adrenaline that sort of get you on the go and pump you up and get you fired up. And that in turn raises blood pressure, and it's normal and it's healthy. And it's interesting, most Olympic records are set in the afternoon. And most world records are set in the afternoon because it's when our bodies are at a peak. And so you have some people who will go in, they'll have their blood pressure tested in the morning, it'll be say 120 over 80. And they'll go back and in the afternoon, it's 128 over 84, and they're really worried. They think their blood pressure has increased. That's not what's happened. In addition, it actually changes over the course of the month and the year. It's fascinating. And that's also natural. So blood pressure fluctuates naturally on a lot of different cycles. And really what it's more meaningful to look at is sort of the average of your blood pressure over a period of months. So the kind of idea of like daily checking, it doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense. Now another thing about blood pressure is it's very sensitive to activity levels, it's very sensitive to diet, and it's very sensitive to stress levels. And that's not only the case over the long term, it's the case over the short term as well. Mm -hmm. So it is true that if you're stressed out, your blood pressure will elevate. Now, if you go into the doctor and you have a bunch of stress with your kids or a bunch of stress around work and that's not a normal situation for you. Or even stress going to the doctor. Or maybe even stress going to the doctor, right. so-called white coat syndrome. People get a little agitated when they're in the doctor's office, they get nervous. Your blood pressure can elevate and it's not really going to give you an authentic reading. So if you have blood pressure concerns, what's really the most effective thing to do is to take your blood pressure, you know, every three days or so in the morning and the afternoon and note that down and that's a good way to track it. But if you don't have acute blood pressure concerns, I'd actually recommend not paying too much attention to your blood pressure, just getting it checked in regular physicals, and instead making the lifestyle changes that are going to help keep blood pressure low and keep you super, super healthy, which is the more interesting stuff that you know, I'd like to focus on in the next couple minutes. Yeah, well, why don't you go ahead because, or first of all, just... Uh, tell me and remind me, what is a dangerous blood pressure reading? Well, there's actually been a lot of controversy about that. Okay. So it's interesting. Uh, years and years and years ago, 120 over 80 was considered normal and healthy. Now we actually believe that that's too high. And we like to see numbers lower than that. Um, it probably varies a lot based on individuals. And one thing that's very funny about the way that we do all medical tests is we bring you in and we say, oh, this is a normal reading. Great. And what normal means is it's whatever is kind of average for the population. Okay. Well, first of all, if the population is sick, normal is not good. Right. Secondly, there's probably meant to be tremendous inherent individual variation in blood pressure. So to my mind, if I'm seeing numbers like 114, 115 over 75 in the morning, that's healthy. That's nothing to worry about. You know, as they begin to creep up to the 130s, 140s, you get concerned. And as they start to go up above that on the systolic, which is the upper number, when you start seeing numbers, you know, like 150 over 86, 94, those kinds of numbers, then there's, there's reason for alarm. There's no question. And of course, as things continue to elevate past there, you get into the more and more alarming ranges. Okay, so uh, you said you wanted to talk about a couple things about uh, how to keep a blood pressure, you know, level and uh, where you're you're doing it through your lifestyle. Absolutely. Uh, rather than, because I'm going to ask you about supplements, I'm going to ask sure. you about medications as well. Sure. So there's three things. There's your your natural way of doing it, yep. your dietary supplement way of doing it, of helping, and, and then, then the medications. medications. So, Absolutely. Well, first off, everything you do that's good for your life and your health is good for blood pressure. And we don't have time to get into everything, but of course, healthy nutrition, avoiding processed foods, you know, salt. Really, it's iodized table salt that seems to elevate blood pressure more than all natural sea salts. 
So if you can find a high quality natural sea salt, real salt is a good brand, and Celtic salt is a good brand, it's better to salt your food with those salts than with iodized normal table sea salt. Um, vegetables tend to lower blood pressure, especially vegetables that are rich in magnesium, which tend to be your darker green vegetables, cucumbers, leafy greens, and they're fantastic for life health as well. Getting enough sleep is great for blood pressure. But the thing I really wanted to focus in on today is exercise and talk a little bit about a way to exercise to specifically lower blood pressure. Oh, good. So the way you want to exercise if your interest is in lowering blood pressure is you want to practice taking your heart rate up and then bringing it down and taking it up and then bringing it down, which isn't a normal focus during exercise. You know, most of us think about exercise if we're younger, if we're a little bit fit, we think, let me go for a run and let me, you know, work out hard for 30 minutes. And as we begin to age, or if we're just getting into exercise, we think, well, let me go for a walk, and I'll just walk at a sustained pace for 20 or 30 minutes. And that's the advice you get from most medical practitioners. Nowhere near as effective at lowering blood pressure, and in fact, nowhere near as effective for life health in general, mm -hmm. as really causing oscillations in your heart rate. It, it's taking your heart rate up and bringing it down, and taking it up and bringing it down, that creates the biochemical changes in our bodies, that over time, lower blood pressure and make us much healthier. So the way you do that is you dedicate somewhere between 20 and 40 minutes, if you're just getting started, 20, if you're already more fit, closer to 40, and don't go over, less is more in this, and do some sort of workout program that gets you out of breath, builds up a sweat, and then brings you down, and gets you out of breath and brings you down. So people who are gym rats may know about spinning or rev. These are uh, bicycle-based classes where they play fast music and you go really fast and they let you recover. Those are good, except they don't let you recover enough. They tend to just keep driving you. What I really recommend that people do is if you work in a gym, get on a lift machine or a treadmill or a bike, and think about moving quickly for three or four minutes, getting out of breath, and then walking and recovering and really catching your breath for a minute or two. And go through somewhere between four and five cycles of that. And that's a really great way to exercise to lower blood pressure. And if you're using a heart rate monitor, a lot of pieces of gym equipment now you can hold and they'll tell you your heart rate. You'll see your heart rate, you know, it'll probably start off around 75 when you start exercising. You'll bring it up to 150, 160, 170. And then walk for two or three minutes and you'll watch it drop down into the 90s or the 80s. And that's wonderful, creating that kind of variation. If you're a little less fit and you're just doing walking, it's great to walk in a place that has hills. If you can sort of walk up hills and down hills, that's going to vary your heart rate. And get yourself a little bit out of breath and then stop to rest. Nothing wrong with stopping to rest during your exercise. Oh. And if you're jogging or running outside, do the same thing. Really vary your pace up. This idea of going out and jogging at a consistent pace, that is 20 years behind the current cutting edge of exercise science. But it's still what's largely recommended in the media and in mainstream medical practice. Far more effective to go out and vary between a walk, a jog, a run, and a sprint. And those words mean what they mean to you. The idea isn't to drive yourself into the ground. You know, for some people, a sprint might be a brisk walk up a slight incline. If that gets you out of breath, that's a sprint to you. It's just varying your pace and giving yourself plenty of time for recovery. And when you do that, you actually train your nervous system to kind of calm you down and chill you out. And over a period of weeks, it, it can be helpful in bringing blood pressure levels down. Good.